Dr. Elizabeth McCarty. And uh, Dr. McCarty is a forest health specialist with UGA's Warnell School of Forest and Natural Resources. And uh, Dr. McCarty received her PhD in entomology from the University of Tennessee in 2016. And her areas of specialization include forest entomology, aquatic entomology, insecticide use in trees, and the environmental risk of insecticides. <laughs> That's a mouthful. I can hardly say it, more or less understand all of that. So, um, but I can tell you, you're in for a treat. I um, first heard Dr. McCarty speak last year. I took the Master Gardener Advanced Training Course called uh, Georgia First Detectors. And uh, the training course focuses on the identification and reporting of invasive species. I thought it was fascinating. I learned a lot and I encourage y'all to, to take it if you're, you're interested in getting some advanced continuing education hours. And the, the one topic that, well, I enjoyed all the topics, but one that I really enjoyed from that, um, that training course was Pollinators for Trees by Dr. McCarty. And uh, that's probably not a surprise, it's probably not a surprise to those of you that know my love of bees. So um, I am so pleased to introduce Dr. McCarty. Her presentation today is titled Trees for Bees. And we'll learn some interesting things about the different insects in our backyards and the habitat needs of pollinators. So please join me in welcoming Dr. McCarty. Join me. Um, so I'm talking about trees for bees. And as you'll see this presentation, I'd maybe say trees for insects. We're talking about insect habitat and all of the layers of the urban forest. And so when we sometimes think about pollinators and pollinator habitat, we we get in our head these sunny areas um, that's a traditional pollinator garden, which is wonderful. And, and I was telling the group when we were getting set up, I, I have one, I love it, it's great, um, but we're not just limited to the sun, uh, sunny areas. So first of all, why should we care about pollinators? All right, so I'd like you to watch some of the, um, you know, we, we hear that a certain percentage of every bite that we eat is because of pollinators, and that's not quite accurate. 76% um, of global crop species rely to pollination to some extent. Um, a lot of the staple crops like rice, wheat, and corn are not pollinated. And so this isn't to not pollinators, but just to let's get some accurate statistics um, and not keep quoting things that are misquoted. But 76% but of crop species rely on pollination to some extent, which is a really important. Um, and then 30% of production from crops um, rely to be on bees for things like increased seed, seed set, fruit weight and quality, increased yields. And for some things like al almonds, they are exclusively insect pollinated. So those things have to have a pollinator. So if we want almonds or almond milk, um, we need those pollinators. But I think, you know, more importantly, they play a vital role for wildflowers, trees, and shrubs, lots of native plants. Most, um, most insect species are specialists. We have some generalists, but a huge portion of them are specialists, and they specialize on our native plants. Um, and then some of the crops that benefit, you know, citrus, banana, blueberry, all these things at the very end and underlined is coffee. We need pollinators for coffee and that is critically important to, I know at least my survival and probably the survival of everyone around me before nine o'clock in the morning. So why am I talking about forest and pollinators? So I am a forest entomologist. Um, my training is in both forest and aquatic entomology. And most of my work has been in hemlock forest looking at insecticide movement in a forest. So how does this get into pollinators? We're looking at how we can use insecticides effectively and then tracing possible non-target impacts. And because I was having to answer so many of these pollinator-based environmental questions, it opened the door for me to begin to work with pollinators as part of my outreach program. And then move from the traditional forest into an urban forest. So as an outline, I'll, I'll do a big picture view and then talk about pollinator needs. And I'll put in parentheses, messy gardening. And you'll hear me use that term over and over in this presentation. 
Um, let's be a little bit messy with our gardening. And it, it kind of gives us a bit license to not have to be so confined into everything looking pristine and perfect. Types of pollinators um, and, and insects in general, and then tree resources that, um, that can be used for pollinators and be incorporated into our landscaping. And then useful information. And I, I share this useful information twice. So here's the first one. If you want to get a screenshot of this um, real quick, and I can also um, copy and paste this into the chat once I'm not presenting, the University of Georgia has a lot of wonderful resources for pollinators. Right. But you know, as, as great as pollinators are, they are facing increasing challenges. And if the pollinators are facing the challenges, um, they're kind of like the, you know, the flag that we wave but a lot of other insects are going to also come under those same umbrellas and be impacted by those same issues, not just pollinators, but herbivores and, and lots of other good native insects. So habitat loss. So if you look at the picture on the bottom right-hand corner, that is you know, the suburbs and you can see that there's some ag fields, some suburbs. Um, what was there a long time ago? Forest and some open meadow areas, possibly some wetlands, all with native plants and native insects and other animals. And so as that habitat is converted, um, there's less capacity in those environments to support those native um, insects. But if we can do, we can make intentional choices that can lift that up and provide that habitat. Um, okay, with the habitat loss, there's less native plants, there's parasite and disease pressures. And as far as honeybees go, um, parasite and disease pressures and um, is probably, well, it is really the, the biggest issue. There are lots of issues for, for honeybees, um, things like, uh, you know, monocultures not having as diverse of a of, of feeding resource for them, the parasites and disease being a big one, unintended consequences of pesticide misuse. And so a tool is only as good as we use it well. And then when we don't use a pesticide within the safety boundaries of that label, then we're asking, we're misusing the tool. And when mis we misuse a tool, then there are going to be some negative consequences. So um, I'll say this, I'm not anti-pesticide by any mean, um, but if you use a pesticide, first ask, do I need to use it? Is it necessary to use a pesticide in this instance? Secondly, am I using it correctly? Which means fully reading the label, looking at the weather, looking at what's happening. Um, and one really easy way I have to prevent overspray is um, I get a piece of poster board and kind of put it around the plant that I do have to treat. And then um, that prevents it from spraying over to things and getting it on things that I'm not intending, but paying attention to weather and the time of day. So if we're using pesticides, which is okay if we need to, Let's use them correctly. All right, so what happens in a forest? And, and we're talking about an urban forest, but a lot of these same processes go on. So we've got a tree. It's taking in carbon dioxide. Oh, there's something wrong here. I didn't have this corrected on this one. It's taking in carbon dioxide. It's going to release oxygen, not carbon dioxide. Leaves are going to fall. That's going to bring carbon source to the ground where the leaf litter is decomposed and we're getting carbon and nutrients back into the soil, the roots are gonna take that back up. We've got respiration and cell death occurring in the roots. Um, leaf litter is gonna break down. And so you've got herbivores, decomposers, you've got all these processes occurring and you can just throw insects onto this figure because they are involved all the way through. So lots of different things happening in an urban forest. These processes happen in a forest but they also happen in the urban forest where we live. They're just a little bit limited because of our practices. So think about like a typical this, um, okay, realizing that we don't want our front yard to look like this, and I got that. But this could be um, in a forest. And actually I took this picture in Great Smoky Mountains National Park. This could be um, that back corner of the yard that you let go a little bit. It could be the vacant lot next to yours. It could be on some public land that's kind of a green space, but a lot's going on here. And lots of different insects can live in this area. We've got herbivores that eat plants, detritivores that are eating dead organic material. And that's really important because we don't want the dead material just to stay there. We need that to get eaten and then get those carbon and those nutrients back into the cycle. Predators eat other organisms. 
Parasites live on or in other organisms. Parasites can be really important um, for biocontrol. And then pollinators. And I put the circle, you know, what makes an insect beneficial? We tend to only think of maybe pollinators as being beneficial or predators. But let's don't forget the parasites, detritivores, and, and herbivores um, are, are beneficial insects. We can think about, you know, like putting the banner out for pollinators, and, and nobody's really advertising for the mighty plant hopper. And, you know, it, it's kind of just missing, it's, it's not being heard, but it is still an important part of that native insect community, and everything's connected. So we need all of these guys to be there. And so in an urban forest, we have insects that are functioning in the canopy, the tree trunks, the shrub layer, herbaceous layer, the forest floor, and even in streams and ponds. So we've got lots of layers of habitat that we can promote and, and supplement. And so I just threw this picture up there, um, all kinds of insects, um, all of these are native. I've got some pest insects in here because I'm a forest health specialist. So I work with insect pecks. This is Ips be beetle or engraver beetle. All right, well, why is this important? Uh, bark beetles are bad, right? Well, bark beetles are part of a natural tree de decomposition process. So when we have a dead tree, we don't want it to sit there standing dead forever. We do need it to break down. When we're in a production pine system and we have stressed trees, then these beetles become problematic. But um, the tree in your yard that the beetles have killed, the beetles are just coming in and taking out something that was on its way out anyway. Um, I've got sycamore lace bug. It's a native insect. It can make the canopy kind of yellow toward the end of the growing season, but those trees, those leaves are gonna fall off and they're on their way out anyway. And so, you know, a lot of these things that we see, things like webworm, we see as, as pest, um, but they are still part of our native insect community. And so um, maybe shift our thinking about when they're a pest, when we need to do something about it, and when we need to just let it be. Historic forests had lower density trees where our current forests, we've got trees that are packed in. Um, you know, there was a light shrub layer because a lot of these were fire maintained, but we have a heavy shrub layer. We think about woods and all these shrubs and all these tight trees, and you don't really think about woods as something that you can just walk through, but that's not really the way that they're supposed to be. You know, when there's a lighter shrub layer, there's more herbaceous plants, which is good for pollinators, and having that healthy herbaceous plant layer is very, very important. Fire is good when it's appropriately maintained. You know, now we have less fire. And there was this matrix of different habitat types. And we still have this matrix of different habitat types, but we've got these high density tree plantings, heavy shrub layer, a forest you have to like, like get your way through. It's very hard to navigate. Um, and that's not good for native insect communities. So what can we do? Um, well, this is what, you know, we have this dense forest areas and a lot of our green spaces that we can't even walk through. And then we have our typical suburban urban habitat. And so there's a lot of hard surface. We see there's a roof, there's driveway, and then there's grass, and then maybe like a couple of little sad boxwoods. Um, and so this does not offer a lot of resources for pollinators, native insects. Um, so what can we do about this? Because this is pretty typical for most of our areas. Um, and, and this isn't I mean, it's bad for insects. Nobody's doing anything wrong, but maybe we can do some things better with more intention to provide more interface for our native insects. And if we, in, we improve our native insects, then that cascades over and that provides food for birds, which increases our native wildlife populations. So let's take this basic house and be intentional about what we put around it. Um, so we've got lots of pictures of native trees. We've also got a water source and herbaceous plants. Um, some of these are native and some of them are not. Well, these are actually all not native. Um, but these actually all down here is from my yard one year after I started my garden. And so that's all habitat that was put in within a year. Um, I had a bunch of Buford hollies and not, uh, knockout roses that I pulled up. 
And so, well, what are these insects, and this is more specific for pollinators, what do they need? They need nectar and forage, moisture and salts, shelter and space. So let's walk through what this means. And like the nectar is, is specific for pollinators, but forage is you know, food and all insects are gonna need some kind of food. So pollen is made out of proteins and lipids and the pollen is collected and consumed on site. And so where pollinators come in is they, they go to the flower, they really, I mean, the nectar is like the sugar and that's a little bit further down. And so that's like having like a Kool-Aid treat and then they have to bypass the pollen. Sometimes they eat it to get to the Kool-Aid and they pick up the pollen on their body, they go to the next flower. And that's why we need pollinators because they move that pollen from plant to plant. Um, and so they're getting these two different resources out of it. Providing these resources year round is really important because we don't wanna just have everything come out in the spring and then have nothing and be like, bet you like that snack, go, go somewhere else. Um, so year round floral resources. Food for larvae and caterpillars. And so I have lots of pictures of caterpillars here. Um, this is where we have to think about what's acceptable to us. Um, it's kind of hard to want a pollinator habitat and provide all these floral resources. And then whenever the caterpillars come, then walk out and spray them with insecticide and then be frustrated that we don't have a lot of butterflies in our pollinator garden. So part of having pollinators is providing what is needed for that entire life cycle. So for butterflies, that means having food there for the caterpillars and then allowing the caterpillars to eat on our plants. Um, and we can manage this in a way that's really a good mix. So maybe don't put your pollinator forage plants right next to the front door where everybody's walking up. I mean, I can see where you would want that to look ratty and messy. So put them around the corner have a spot that you're going to say this is kind of an out of the way spot and I have a great tolerance for these plants to get all chewed up and that's okay with me. Um, and then diverse sources. So um, try to get away from just planting one or two things. I mean, it looks great in some design where there's like two or three different kinds of plants and that's it, but, but branch out and um, let's get some diversity for timing and for different resources. Um, so a word about native and invasive plants. Um, I've had people want me to give presentations and say that native plants are not good for pollinators. Um, and I'll say this carefully. There are a lot of or invasive plants are not good for pollinators. There are a lot of invasive plants that pollinators love. So I'm not going to act like the privet is going to be jam up with pollinators. They love it. Um, the thing is, is that we're probably getting a lot of generalist pollinators on those plants, things like honeybees and, and things that will feed on anything, where when we put native plants in, we're going to provide resource for the generalist pollinators, but the specialist pollinators as well. So while I'm not anti non-native, there's lots of things that you can get at big box stores that will be a great floral benefit to your plantings. So if it's not invasive, if it's not problematic, you know, go for it, put it out there. Um, when we first did the Trees for Bees outreach materials, we thought, do we just want to stick to native? But the answer is no, because that can be too limiting for people. Sometimes it's really hard to get native plants. Um, they're not always accessible. I've got resources for that at the end of the presentation. So non-native, whenever it's not an invasive issue in your yard planting, you know, okay, um, don't go plant them out in the woods or anything. All right, next is moisture and salts. And so insects need, they still need salts and they still need water. So like we need Gatorade sometimes, um, they need salts. And so providing bare soil is a really good fit for this because um, they will go and lick the salts off of it. Uh, so there's a couple of benefits to having bare soil. And so most places in urban suburban settings, we don't want bare soil. We want, we want like beautiful, We'd feed reed free grass all the way up to our sidewalk and all the way under our trees. Um, but it's okay, you know, you have that spot in the yard that you just can't get your grass to grow on and you're kind of frustrated. And it's okay, just let it go because the pollinators are going to be getting salts off of it. And then um, right now you may see a lot of, and I'm kind of speaking ahead in my talk, but this is a great time of year to see soil dwelling bees. 
and their nest. They're very visual at this moment. And in fact, two days ago, I was in a friend's yard. I was like, come see all the bee nests that you have in your, on your bare dirt. All right, shelter, things like rock piles, log piles, nesting boxes for bees, and then pithy stems. So this is a great time of year to start cutting things back. Um, I actually like to, um, hang on. I like to, um, I don't cut back at the fall. I just let it sit for the winter. And then this time of year, I'll cut back. And then where there's um, like your sages that you're cutting back where they've got these pithy stems, I actually cut it like a foot, a foot and a half off the ground. I don't cut it all the way down to the ground. And the reason is, is that those stems are sort of hollowed out and can be used for nesting sites. And then the plant grows up around it. And then there's this resource that's hidden under the foliage. It's not going to be visually, you know, a problem because all those, the new spring growth will, will grow up around it. Things like moss. Can y'all hear me? Yes, okay. Um, the rock piles are great places for um, things like caterpillars to um, pupate. It's a little bit warmer, so it's a good place for hiding. And then nesting boxes for bees. So bees, um, things like leafcutter bees and um, mason bees, they like to build nests in cavities. And so where they would typically do this is in decaying wood. Um, so when you have like wood borers that bore holes into trees that are dying, then these bees will go in and build nests in there, but we don't leave a lot of that in our urban area. Um, we, we quickly remove any decaying wood. So it's great if we can provide a resource for them. And we have instructions from a UGA document on how to do this. And this is a great uh, outreach activity. You can get woodworkers involved. Um, kids can go check the nesting boxes throughout the year. I've got about four of these up in the yard and it, it's like a whole family of, you know, adventure. Um, try, there we go. And then space, like I said, that dry, dry soil for nesting sites. Um, and so you'll kind of see these little um, right now and you kind of, you look at them and you wonder if they're little ant mounds. And they're about that big around and they kind of have this pebbled up soil little like um, kind of looks like big sprinkles that you would put on cookies. It's about that shape and size and little beady soil around the edge. And that's where cap, uh, soil dwelling bees are coming in and making their nest. Um, open flat surfaces like flagstones and um, pavers. Those are great places for butterflies to warm up. When you see them sitting there in the morning and they're not going anywhere, they're just sitting there, they're waiting to warm up enough to be able to move. All right, so there's different types of pollinators that we can find in our garden. And if we don't know, and I say garden, but I, and sometimes I say habitat, because really we're building a habitat for them. It's more than just a garden. Um, and we're providing diversity to this habitat to fit all of the needs of their entire life cycle. We don't just wanna feed them, you know, we want them to have that space and, and those, that diversity of needs. So that's where we get into that messy gardening idea of having a wood pile in the back and you know letting our plants go a little bit, let it be a little bit messy. And that messiness, that not quite perfectly manicured um, is really providing a lot of benefit. And there are ways to do this that can still meet HOA requirements. It doesn't have to look like that crazy lady's yard or anything like that. But if you want it to, then that's awesome. Um, so we have lots of different types of pollinators. It's not just bees and, and it's really not just honeybees. So first of all, beetles. There are lots of different kinds of beetles out there and they can serve many, many different functions. They can be pollinators like the flower beetle and the soldier beetle. They're herbivores, they're detritivores. A lot of the larger longhorn beetles are wood boring beetles and they are part of breaking down trees that are dead and dying. They can also be predators. Flies, look at all the functions, pollinators, herbivores, detritivores, predators, and parasites. So they, they serve many different roles. 
wasp can be pollinators, herbivores, predators, and parasites. And so I've got, you know, typically what we think of as a wasp, but I've also included sawflies in here because sometimes they are considered a pest. Um, sawflies are a, a more primitive type of wasp. And so this is a picture I took. It was of a hollyhock sawfly. And I just would let my hollyhocks bloom and then just let the sawflies hit them. They hit them every year. It looked kind of ratty. It was on the side of the house. It provided habitat for them. And the next year, the hollyhock would come back out again. It would bloom. And then we'd kind of go through this cycle. And I just figured it was a good enough trade-off. It kind of entertained me. Um, paper wasps. So these people get nervous about because they can sting you and it does hurt a lot. Um, so let's think about where our tolerance is on this. Um, nobody wants to get stung by a wasp. We don't need to have a paper wasp nest on the kids' swing set. Um, but I weed, I hand weed my garden. I'm in there a lot and there are paper wasps all over the place. And pretty much if I don't bug them, they don't bug me. So let's think about where our tolerance level is. Um, how much we can tolerate, you know, do you not want any wasps to ever be in the garden? Um, they're, they're probably going, going to be there, but then there are some places that are definitely not safe to have their nest. So kind of think about where your, your boundaries of acceptability are. True bugs, these are not pollinators, but they're definitely worth putting in there. They are herbivores, detritivores, and predators. Um, th this is a spittle bug, you know, we see this a lot. Um, this is a picture I took when I was working on my master's in Alabama. It's a plant hopper. This is a native insect. And so we do have some crazy looking native um, true bugs that are herbivores that, you know, are a part of the whole system. And so we're going to have herbivores hit our plants. Um, if we see a leaf hopper, does that mean that we need to run out with the pesticide, the, you know, the seven dust? Probably not. Um, if you have things like um, squash and you get to late summer, I, at least in South Georgia, we're going to have white fly problems. And so then think about what you need to treat, where you need to treat and, and where those boundaries need to be. Um, butterflies and moths, these are both herbivores and pollinators. And I've intentionally put in a picture of a saddleback. So there are safety concerns. There are some pollinators that, um, that are caterpillars that are poisonous. And so just be careful with what you have in there. If I had little kids running around the garden and saw a saddleback, I probably wouldn't let it stay out there. Um, if nobody's out there but me weeding stuff, I'll probably leave it. All right, a word about honeybees. Um, unfortunately, honeybees are, are a little bit on a pedestal with people when they think about pollinators and they automatically go to honeybees and they think about saving the bees and we need to save honeybees. Honeybees are fine, they're just, they're not a native pollinator. They're native to Europe, they were brought over with the settlers. They're widely used commercially um, for both honey and pollination service. So they're, they're essentially like a managed agricultural commodity. They are here because we manage them. And how successful a hive is, has a lot to do with how well it's managed. Um, there are lots of pests and diseases that are problematic. Um, moving them around can be problematic. So hive success has a lot to do with hive management. They do live in these large colonies of up to 60,000 bees, and they are good pollinators. They can visit 50 to 100 flowers per trip, but they are not the best indicators of ecosystem health because they are not native pollinators and they are managed. So if we want to worry about ecosystem health, that's where we want to shift our focus to native pollinators. Um, but the concept of save pollinators, so let's have more honey hive, honeybee hives, um, is sort of like saying we want to save the native shorebirds, so we're going to put a bunch of chickens on the beach. It's just, it's not the same thing. Honeybees aren't bad, they serve an important agricultural service, um, but I like to try to focus on native pollinators more when I am looking at assessing an ecosystem. There are 3,500 species of native bees in the United States. Most of them are, are solitary. They live by themselves. Bumblebees do live in colonies, but they're much smaller than honeybees. And they are a much better indicator of ecosystem health. Um, they have in the past been understudied, but bee research is exploding, which is a very good thing. So for a few of the native pollinators, uh, mason bees, 
They're called mason bees because they use mud. And so they build these cells, that's a picture on the bottom of the screen, and this is how they reproduce. So each cell is divided by a plug of mud and the female will lay an egg and then she'll provision it with some pollen and nectar and then divide, put another cell in here. And so what they'll do is they'll lay it where the outside of the hole will have male eggs and the males will hatch and fly out and then they're waiting for the females and the, the cells that are further in are females and they'll hatch a little bit later. And these emerge in the spring. Now is a really good time for these guys. They should be out and about. Leaf cutter bees are a little bit later in the season from like late spring into summer. And they do something very similar. Um, the only difference is that their nest, the dividers are made with leaves um, and they're made in a cavity hole, same kind of thing, different cells divided by leaves. And <clears throat> mason bees, if you look like on the nesting boxes, they'll plug their, their, um, their holes with mud, whereas leafcutter bees, it's this kind of shiny iridescent fluid that they make. I should probably, I've got pictures of it from my nesting boxes. I keep meaning to add it to this presentation. And then bumblebees, um, these do have colonies of up to 500 individuals. They have annual nests. These will last a year. The next year, a new female will come out. She will start the nest and collect the pollen and start feeding it. And then eventually her daughters will take over getting the pollen and she'll just have a reproductive purpose. So a lot of times um, bumblebees will clear out old nest during the spring. So if you see dead bumblebees in the spring, it's most often caused by them cleaning out the dead bodies out of the nest. And then carpenter bees, this is one that can be problematic for people because um, they dig hunt tunnels in wood. So if you provide a nesting box, they're not going to go to those cells. They wanna dig their own tunnels and they make cells the same way as the mason and the leaf cutter bees. And they separate the chambers with wood chips. And then the adults emerge and they hibernate over winter. They can be problematic. Um, we don't want them you know, making holes in our fences and our decks and our sidings. So sometimes it is necessary to use an insecticide for that. Um, I've got people, they'll ask, well, what if I just put a chunk of wood out in the yard and they can feed on that um, and it'll draw them away. And unfortunately it, it doesn't work that way because they don't know they're supposed to go to that chunk of wood and not go to your house. And then hummingbirds, it's not an insect, but it is an important pollinator that we do get in our gardens. And then we choose to supplement also with, with hummingbird feeders. I've got the ones with the suction cups that stick up to my window. They're super fun. Just be sure with hummingbird feeders that you clean out, clean them out and put in fresh um, sugar water. Um, we don't wanna leave it out there for a month and have it get nasty and make the birds sick. So let's meet the trees. I've got a little bit more time to talk. So let's talk about um, the trees that we can use in our landscaping. The ones that I mentioned are all native trees. So some science about pollinators and trees. Um, we think about the herbaceous layer is important for pollinators, all those herbaceous plants, but trees are also wonderful resources for bees. Um, there was a study done by the United States Forest Service in Athens, and they put uh, bee traps about three feet off the forest floor and about, um, a I think, over 45 feet high in the tree canopy. And they actually got higher bee abundance. So more bees and more species of bees higher in the canopy as opposed to on the forest floor. Um, and they got it in the summer as well, which was surprising. And so why in the world are bees up in the tree canopy during the summer? Um, it may be that like August is not a booming time for flowering plants in the forest. So it may be that they're going up there and feeding on um, like honeydew from insects as well as tree sap to get some of those sugar resources. Another reason that trees are great for pollinators is because what's happening right now? Trees are blooming all over the place. I've got a red bud and a southern crab apple in my backyard just going nuts and the bees are all over them. But a lot of my herbaceous plants in the flower beds are not really going yet. They're just starting to get geared up. 
So trees provide, the flowers from trees provide floral resources at a time when the herbaceous plants aren't really going um, as strongly. So here are some that we can um, potentially include. Um, American holly, and this is good for people who want more of a formal look. It blooms in the spring. They're dioecious, so they'll either have male or female trees, so keep that in mind. Um, and it's attractive to bees, birds, and butterflies. It makes the, um, the berries, which is attractive to wildlife. Yopon holly is another one that um, people like to have in a more formal setting, and they can get that growth pattern that you see on the, the left-hand side where the branches are trained to droop down. Um, the flowers are not very conspicuous, but it is um, attractive to birds, and then small mammals will eat, and birds will eat on the, um, the berries. And it can tr tolerate a lot of dry soil. Um, you've got to watch it with Yopon because it can try to take over a little bit. So just keep that in mind. Flora Anna's tree. This is a nice one. Um, at least in my neck of the woods, it tends to grow more in riparian areas. Um, it's got dark red blooms in the spring, evergreen, um, kind of a thick, thicker leaf. And so this would be nice um, if you want that green appearance. Like, if you like the look of shrubbery and having that constant green year round, then some of these would be a really good fit um, for your plantings. And so like, I don't have a lot of evergreens. It mostly looks like a bunch of dead sticks in the winter and I'm okay with that. But some people really want something that looks a little bit more polished than that. And that is perfectly okay. There are great options if that's the look that you want. Wild olive, um, this thing is blooming like crazy right now. Um, it grows 10 to 20 feet and will work in sun or partial shade. It likes fertile, moist, well-drained soils. I know I've talked to some people that are maintaining habitats and they can have a little bit of you know, trouble with this, getting too much, but um, no, I'm sorry, this is not the one that's blooming right now. But anyhow, it's fragrant, it's deer resistant. It does um, have a more of a shrubby appearance. And I noticed with a lot of these, these are trees that don't get very large. You may not have the space for a very large tree. Um, an 80 foot tree is not always the right fit. So a lot of these are really, um, would be acceptable plantings for smaller urban and suburban areas. Here we go, this is it, Carolina cherry laurel. This is the one that's blooming like crazy. I was out taking pictures of one this morning and I'm hoping I get better sunlight later on so I can actually populate this with my own pictures. Um, they grow 15 to 30 feet high. They have shiny evergreen leaves with kind of a fuzzy underleaf surface. And they've got these showy clusters of leaves. And these definitely um, remind me of some of the more, um, the non-native shrubs that people put up. They have a really similar appearance to some of those. And so that would be a look that would be you know, pretty acceptable for a lot of people who want more of that traditional shrub look. Um, they like moist, well-drained, loose soils. They're attractive to bees and birds. Um, so this is a really good fit for somebody who wants, you know, a little bit more of a formal, less messy look. Staghorn sumac, this is not something for a less messy look. This is a messy plant and it can tend to, um, this is another one that can get away with you if you're not careful with it. Um, it's 15 to 30 feet tall. It's, it, it puts on a show three times during the year. It's got these, you know, moving from the right the left to the right, it's got these white flowers earlier in the year, and then that develops into clusters of berries that birds like. Um, and then it does have nice red color in the fall. So if you want something with fall color, this is a good native to fit that. But it does it, it's not very shrubby looking. So it does have a little bit more of a, a messy look. Carolina Silverbell, this is one of my favorites. Um, they've got some beautiful ones on the Valdosta States campus. And if I put in any more trees in my yard, this one is gonna be it. Um, it is really pretty. They grow 20 to 35 feet. It's got these really pretty slow, showy, um, these white flowers. And it almost looks like they're kind of floating in the shade. It will bloom in parts, in sun or part shade. And it's got this cool striped bark. So the picture that's kind of in the middle, that bark is a whitish and green stripy look. And then a Southern gardening staple is the dogwood. Um, 
Uh, it is a great addition, but it is it does need some care. There are some issues. It can grow 20 to 40 feet. It can have white or pink flowers. Y'all are up in the Atlanta area, so you're getting some of the pink flowers. We don't get these down here. Pretty uh, reddish uh, scarlet foliage in the fall, berries for wildlife. So lots of benefits happening in the yard from these. <clears throat> I've got about three or four nice ones in my yard and I really do enjoy them. They like that well-drained acidic soil. So they like, you see them a lot around pine trees, but dogwood anthracnose and downy mildew can be issues. Um, for downy mildew, um, you can put fungicide on it, but it's something that you'd have to do kind of often and it's not really a good fit. It's pretty high maintenance. So I recommend planting this in sunnier areas and it tends to do a bit better with the downy mildew. So you may notice that dogwoods in the forest have largely died out, but the ones in yards hold on a little bit longer. And then University of Tennessee did develop some anthracnose resistant dogwood trees. And so those may be carried um, by some nurseries. <clears throat> the anthracnose resistant ones tend to not make um, berries. So it won't have berries for the birds, but if you're planting them and it's something that you, you want, you don't want the take chance of it getting anthracnose, then look for anthracnose resistant varieties. Redbud, um, this is one of my favorites. Excuse me. <clears throat> I have a beautiful old redwood tree in my yard. It's probably about 40 years old. <clears throat> they grow 15 to 30 feet high. It is in full bloom right now. Um, these pinkish purple flowers, the bumblebees love it. Leaf cutter bees use the leaves. Um, it's attractive to wildlife, lots of bee species. Um, this is a really great one. It's not, you know, you don't often see a lot of old ones. It's probably not gonna be a hundred year tree. But golly, it's, it's really pretty um, and a great pollinator resource. Witch hazel is a cool one because it blooms in the fall. It blooms once all the leaves have gone off and not many plants do that. Um, it'll probably be the only color out there whenever the leaves have fallen off. It, cover, it has a wide range, it's attractive to birds. It is pollinated by a winter flying moth and it does have you know, medicinal uses. So the witch hazel that you see in the pharmacy that is um, next, to the, uh, next to the alcohol, it's an anti-inflammatory. It's great for skin irritation and it is made from this plant. And the way, the easiest way to identify it, you've got these kind of leaves, but you notice where here, where the leaf bases meet the petiole, it's, they don't come together evenly. And that's a, that's a dead ringer for a witch hazel. All right, and then two large trees, because sometimes we want big trees. Red maple <clears throat> grows 50 to 100 feet, and it's got red flowers. They're blooming now where I am in the spring. It, then it'll get the seed pods that have the reddish color on them. And then again, we get red foliage in the fall. And it's one of the few things that I, we get really nice color with down here in Tifton. It's a good larval food source for caterpillars and it's attractive to bees and birds. So this is a nice one to add. I don't have this in here now, um, I need to add it, but oak trees are great for caterpillars um, and caterpillars are great for birds. And if you've ever had a chance to read any of Doug Tallamy's work, um, he really brings home the importance of oaks and has done a lot of important research on them. And then lastly, tulip poplar. Um, this is a big tree. It'll grow fast, long, straight trunk, up to 100 feet tall. These really nice size um, yellow flowers in the spring. And it's a great resource for birds, bees, and butterflies. It's also a larval host for the eastern tiger swallowtail. So if you have tulip poplars, you're very likely to have a lot of swallowtails around. And then lastly, just a few things that I don't cover um, more in detail, but there's lots of other native trees black cherries, buckeyes, fringe trees, southern crab apple. I have one of these in bloom and it is just beautiful. Uh, I've already mentioned, some of these I've already covered. Um, and then, so resources, a team of us at the University of Georgia in 2018 did a Trees for Bees um, education initiative that included 
extension papers, newsletter articles, YouTube video, a shade garden tutorial, an annotated PowerPoint presentation, color sheets for kids activities, and a nesting box hands-on project. So this is basically outreach in a box. So if you were having an education event, it was geared for county agents, but was also really good for master gardener groups. If you want to have some kind of an event, everything is here ready to go. Um, this works from kid groups all the way up to, um, I did something at the senior center in Tifton and it was wonderful. Three different extension papers were um, written off of this management of turf grass, insect pest, and pollinator protection. So let's have that turf grass, but let's do it in a way that's most protective. Creating pollinator nesting boxes to help native bees. And that's one that Becky Griffin and I wrote together. And then selecting trees and shrubs as resources for pollinators. That one is dynamite. It has tables with bloom times and all kinds of information. So if you have a more shady area and you wanna know, well, what should I plant? This has it all for you. And then a hands-on bee building project, one page. I mean, it's a longer outreach document, but there's a one page you can print it out and have it there for the event. And so all of that information is on the UGA Extension Protecting Pollinators page. It also has a couple of newsletters you could just share. If you have a newsletter, you just share the article, um, just put it in your newsletter. The UGA Center for Urban Agriculture has a link for building your pollinator garden. And they have lots of um, different outreach resources, different um, guidance papers. There's some overlap between those two sites, but I would recommend, um, I'll put this link in the chat because this one you kind of have to dig for. It's a little bit hard to find. Uh, Becky Griffin has started the Great Georgia Pollinator Podcast this year. I did a talk for the, I did a, a, one of her podcasts for that. There's also the Great Georgia Pollinator Census, which I know that this group knows about and is probably in the, in the process of building habitat for it right now. And then the State Botanical Garden has a conservation program, and they have things like Connect to Protect, where you can certify your pollinator garden as a Connect to Protect garden. Um, it comes with signage and the information that you have to put in for it. Um, the requirements really helps you build that, that diverse set of resources for numerous state life stages of the pollinator. Um, my application is in for my, my pollinator garden at my house. And then we're also starting one on the Tifton campus right outside this window um, this year. We've got Georgia Pollinator Plants of the Year. This is a multi-agency team that works with the green industry to get them to help produce and market four plants a year that are um, pollinator plants of the year. And so we've got people from DNR and all kinds of other places that are on this, this team that picks the plants. I think 2020 was the first year that the plants were produced. And so we have another suite of plants coming out this year. And then um, there's the Georgia Native Plant Initiative. And on this, you can also find links to um, native plant nurseries, which is really important. It's hard to get native plants if you don't know where to go to get them. Although there are some native plants that are you know, offered by the big box stores, it's, it's good to know which ones are native, which ones are not to make some of those choices. And so this is the slide that I'll leave you with. Um, I'll leave it up for a few more minutes as the questions go on. And then I'll um, stop my share and put these links in the chat. So I'll be glad to take any questions. Dr. McCarty, thank you. That was just Wonderful. And we do have a, um, a number of questions that came in through the chat. Can you see those and address them or I'd be glad to read them off to you? Um, is Buford Holly not as good for pollinator? Whoa, they keep, let me start at the top here. I don't know if y'all can see them or not. Let's see here. Do carpenter bees return to the same site each year? I do not know. It's going to be a new carpenter bee. Um, so that'll be a new generation coming out each year. Um, uh, I, the, um, it's my understanding they do return to the same place where that they were born. I've gotcha. had issues. I've had issues with carpenter bees and um, this is what I was informed of. A lot of insects, I mean, that doesn't surprise me. A lot of insects will return. I mean, they emerge from those holes. They kind of go back to that same area. Some of them move around. So that, that's not surprising at all. What is anthracnose? That is a fungal disease that attacks dogwoods. 
Um, and so if your planting dog was, especially, I, mean, I would think in the Atlanta area, you would need to get anthracnose resistant dogwoods, um, or at least consider it. Um, wax myrtle, yes, wax myrtle is native. I think that would be a good addition. Um, spraying for mosquitoes in our yards. I keep getting this question. Um, okay, maybe the urban entomologist would disagree with me, but um, it depends on what somebody is spraying, first of all. If they are spraying BT insecticide, then that is something that is geared toward flies only. And BT insecticide is what is often being sprayed by the truck. It's not a broad spectrum. It targets, it targets flies. And so um, that's different than spraying a broad spectrum insecticide. I'm not sure when they're spraying the foliage to get rid of mosquitoes. I mean, my aunt does it, she loves it. Um, I think that that's probably not consistent with developing insect habitat. And the best way to manage for mosquitoes is to remove the larval sources. So standing water. We want standing, it's a little bit of water sources for pollinators, but it needs to be fresh water. When we leave standing water that's stagnant, then we're, we're gonna have mosquitoes. Um, so that is first up. Now you can't control what your neighbor has. And so when I lived in Alabama, I maintained no standing water. My neighbor did not. And so it didn't matter what I did in her yard, my yard, her yard was gonna come over into my space and, and I was gonna get mosquitoes from her yard because of all of her standing water. Um, but I would encourage people to um, eliminate the standing water. If you're putting water out for bird feeders and everything, keep it fresh. Put it in places that it's easy for you to replenish it with fresh water often. Um, I'm not going to spray my yard for mosquitoes. It depends on where your yard is. If you're backed up to a wetland or a pond, um, you're probably going to have mosquitoes. I'd rather spray a little bit of spray on myself than spray my whole yard, though. The <laughs> bug refers to um, it's an order of insects called Hemiptera. And so insects are broken up into different orders and the Hemipterans are the true bugs. So those would be things like stink bugs, aphids, um, leaf footed bugs, plant hoppers, leaf hoppers. Those are the things that are in that true bug category. How do we get the Trees for Bees outreach box? Um, if you go to the UGA Protecting Pollinators, then all of that information will be there. So go to that website. If you just Google UGA Extension Protecting Pollinators, there'll be links to everything. And then if, if the box, as far as the nesting box, there's instructions there for how to build one. Very important, use untreated wood for nesting boxes. Don't use treated wood. Um, Buford holly is not a native. So is Buford holly as good for pollinators as American holly? American holly is a native, Buford holly is a non-native. They'll probably both, you know, they're both have floral sources for pollinators. Um, American holly is gonna have other functions for native insects. Um, can I comment on the use of decoy hornet's nest to keep carpenter bees away? I had not heard about that until like a year ago. And my answer on that is I don't, I don't know um, about that. I've seen it and I've kind of like raised an eyebrow, but I, I don't know how effective that would be. Um, I would like to plant a year round pollinator garden. What resource would you recommend that has blooms in different seasons? Um, start with the protecting pollinator page. The trees and shrubs for native bees is a good one to, to get some of that foundation. And then for things that are smaller, um, I would go to, uh, I'm not sure which extension publication has that information. I'm, I'm pretty sure Chris Brahman has published something on it. I would start to look around the Center for Urban Agriculture and find something that's going to break it into seasons. I know it's there. I know it's one of those documents. 
Um, my email is, I'll put that in the chat and whoever asked that question. Um, if you can't find it, let me know and I'll find it for you. Um, and last one. Do mosquitoes live under leaves? They might like settle there to rest, but I don't know if they live under leaves. All right, and I'm gonna stop my share and then copy and paste the information from this PowerPoint in the chat. Dr. McCarty, I again want to thank you. You can tell from the, the questions that you received that we were an engaged audience and really enjoyed your presentation. Um, I would like to ask if there's any other questions besides those that were typed in. Yes. Did someone say yes? Okay, well, um, Dr. McCarty, on behalf of us um, all- Marlisa has a question, but she keeps muting herself. I'm sorry, I'm screwed up there. Can you hear me? Yeah. I like your background. Oh, now she's muted again. Yeah. Sorry, I'm sorry, I apologize. So it's been a long morning already, guys. Um, Quick question. You had a list, a whole list. Of, well, there was a, a segment of pictures, nine or 10 different um, plants that were um, past what you wrote down. Uh, it started with the red buckeye that was after oh. your large trees. Can you? Oh, they are not. They're not past. Those are just other no, names. Not past. Different plants. I'm sorry. Yes. Um, the PDF is being saved. Okay can list some of those for you um that'd be great all right some of they were mostly shrubs large shrubs i think yeah so southern sugar maple okay red buckeye fringe tree okay sour uh, sour wood yeah definitely black cherry okay. and southern crab apple okay. the second page kind of overlapped with some of the things I did. Right. Sometimes I, I do this presentation and I kind of change it every time. And so sometimes I get some overlap. Okay, um, very good. I will... Thank you so much. It's, it's, a, it's a wide assortment that you offered to us and I'm trying to scribble notes and um, I'm actually doing a talk <laughs> this coming Sunday and it will include the conversation only specifically about honeybees because that's what people are interested in. That's yeah, not, I'm not anti-honeybee, I just- No, 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 I know. Um, well, I'm, I'm gonna pull up, I'm gonna share my screen again mm -hmm. um, to show you this. So this is the selecting trees and shrubs as resources for pollinators. And so there's a lot of information on the bees you'll find and other pollinators. Um, but what I wanna show you is it goes through some of the trees and shrubs with a lot of the information I had in my presentation, a lot of that was taken you know, from this because we made, you know, the presentation was part of this effort. Um, and so lots of different options with information. And then in the back, we have the bloom time, wow. the growth habit, um, whether it's native or not, the flower color. And so this is really helpful for planning. Um, and it was written by, um, Chris Brahman was the primary author, she and Bodhi Panisi, and then myself, and then Kim Toll, who was a county agent. So this is a really good resource, but it doesn't have the herbaceous plants, but there are resources for the herbaceous plants. And then, um, it's one of the federal agencies, maybe NRCS. They have this kind of stuff for native, like herbaceous plants. Um, but I'm, I'm fairly sure that there's something on that UGA um, Center for Urban Ag that'll have that for the more horticultural herbaceous varieties. Great, thank you so very much. Or just do what I do and just get stuff and shove it places as you have space for it. It works. It works. <laughs>
And I'm like, I got a bunch of native plants from Bodhi Panisi last summer. It was fall. And I just had to get them in the ground. So my daughter and I were out with like flashlights, just putting them places. And so now this year I'm waiting for everything to come up to see what's where and then do about it. Right. Wonderful. Good for you. I'm Thank glad you. to see somebody else gardens like I do. Just find a spot and put it in there. <laughs> and if it's not happy, we'll move it. And then sometimes it doesn't work out. Like I have this bee balm that will not grow. It stays this high. It spreads everywhere and it doesn't flower. It never gets high. So now I just kill it. <laughs> I think the moral of the story is get a headlight. Invest in a headlamp rather for your head. It really yeah, we, we, yeah, but we had, we had headlamps and she just like cast off. I'm like, no, we have to get these in the ground now. <laughs> Well, Dr. McCarty, again, I want to thank you so much for <clears throat> all that wonderful information. It came at such a timely um, time as uh, spring is, feels like it's here already, and we're all so eager to get out in our gardens, and uh, this is just great insight for us. We'll uh, certainly look into the documents you sent, and we appreciate you giving us your email as well so folks can reach out to you should they have questions no problem i'm about if you have questions and i don't get back to you this week i'm on i'm out in the in the smokies picking out field sites so um just be a little patient sounds fun well all right everyone at this point um i'd like to uh 